Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode 145, James Steiner Dillon, Expert Malpractice. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Alex Nunn, from the University of Arkansas School of Law. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence and proof. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. Joining me on the podcast today is James Steiner Dillon, an associate professor of law at the University of Akron School of Law. James and I are going to chat about his most recent paper, which is entitled Expert Malpractice and is now forthcoming in the Utah Law Review. And this is really a great paper, a fascinating topic, because I'm sure we're all familiar, at least at a baseline level, with expert witnesses and with the centrally important role that expert witnesses play at many trials. But what happens when the expert witnesses themselves are the reason that a case falls apart? That is, what happens when we have parties trying to hold expert witnesses to account for their failures or their shortcomings in the courtroom? My conversation with James today focuses on precisely that question. James, welcome to Excited Utterance. Thanks, Alex. It's great to be here. So today we're focusing on expert witnesses, which is always a fascinating topic. But before we get into anything too substantive today, I was just curious, initially having read your paper, what led you to focus on expert witnesses in the project? Sure. Well, I've written a few things about experts in the past, mostly from a more theoretical perspective. I've written some stuff about the epistemological difficulties that courts face in in analyzing expert testimony. Lately, I've been getting interested in what I think of as the business of expertise, that is the expert as a professional service provider. Many of the rules relating to admissibility and just the treatment of expert testimony seem to be written on the assumption that providing expert testimony in court is an extraordinary part of the expert's job, that experts generally have other professional identities and they maybe descend from the ivory tower once or a few times to offer testimony on some issue that's especially close to their area of expertise. But for many, and I think probably most testifying experts, this is their day job. They're full-time providers of litigation support services who spend most of their time and make most of their income from work relating to providing expert testimony in in legal proceedings. And expert malpractice is a particularly useful entry point for thinking about this because it's it's an area in which these paradigms seem to pull a bit apart. On one hand, expert witnesses are witnesses, and some argue that civil immunity that attaches to other witnesses should apply to them as well. Others argue that because experts are providing professional services, they should be held to the same standards of professional competence and subject to the same liability that other professionals are. So your paper notes that that expert witness duality, if you will, that tension that we're discussing, has sometimes led to litigation by parties unhappy with the performance of of their very own expert witness, right? So tell us about that kind of interesting phenomenon. Yeah, there are different ways in which that sort of unhappiness can arise. One of them is when the client is simply upset that the expert expressed an opinion that didn't sufficiently support the client's position. Those cases, I think, are relatively easy to resolve simply through the application of of contract law. I'll elaborate on that later. But we also see cases in which the client alleges that the expert failed to act with professional competence in the preparation of their opinion or their report. And that that failure either led to an adverse outcome or in some way harmed the client's litigation prospects. That's typically the context in which we see professional malpractice claims asserted against experts. So you note in your paper that there are six types of claims often brought against friendly expert witnesses by disgruntled parties. So walk us through some of those, if you would. Sure. And let me say, first of all, that the reason that this typology is important The reason that it's helpful to develop a typology of the different kinds of expert malpractice claims that are brought is that I ultimately want to argue that the arguments about absolute immunity for uh, expert witnesses in the existing case law and in the prior scholarship have not, in my view, done a very good job of connecting the rationales that are offered for immunizing experts 
to the nuts and bolts reality of the cases that are litigated, and particularly with a view to the substantive law, the law of professional malpractice and also contract that apply to them. But I identified six different types, each of which I want to note has at least one real life example. That is, there's at least one reported opinion of each of these types of expert malpractice claims. The first three types kind of fall into one group insofar as the allegations do not relate to the substance of the expert opinion. Type one, I call nonfeasance, in which the expert is just alleged to have failed to perform some duty that the expert was obliged to perform. The one case that I talk about there is where the expert just failed to submit a report at all and then was sued for having failed to do that. Type two, deal with fraud or intentional malfeasance by the expert. Again, intentional fraud by the expert on the client. And type three deals with a breach of the duty of care unrelated to the formation or the substance of the expert opinion. So here the plaintiff alleged that the expert breached some duty to the plaintiff in ways that affected the plaintiff's litigation prospects, but are not related to the substance or the process of forming the expert's opinion. Types four through six relate to claims that in some way involve the substance of the opinion. Type four claims involve the negligent formation of the expert's initial opinion. The plaintiff alleges that the expert failed to exercise due care in the formation of the expert's initial opinion, and that's what caused injury to the plaintiff when the error was later revealed. Type 5 claims assert a negligent change in opinion. The plaintiff alleges that the defendant expert negligently changed her opinion to the plaintiff's detriment or the plaintiff's injury. And then finally, type six claims assert an injury arriving, uh, arising from a non-negligent formation or change in the expert's opinion. In other words, that the expert's opinion, although it was not negligently arrived at or changed, caused some harm to the plaintiff in the underlying litigation. So, James, when I hear about those six types of claims that are being brought against expert witnesses, my mind immediately drifts to, well, what are the response to those claims? So what normative principles do advocates of absolute immunity rely upon to insist that, hey, expert witnesses should actually not be held liable? Yeah, I identify two normative principles that you see running through the case law and the prior scholarship presented by advocates of immunity, people arguing that experts should be immune from malpractice claims. The first one I call the client primacy principle. And arguments invoking this principle assert that expert malpractice liability is inappropriate because the expert client controls the selection and presentation of evidence, decides on which legal theories to assert, and instructs the expert, the client, the argument goes, therefore bears greater culpability for the failure of the client's case. The second principle I call the subordination principle, which asserts that because experts serve as servants of the court, that's a phrase that runs through a lot of the the case law and the scholarship, therefore any private duty that the expert owes to the client is legally subordinated to the expert's obligation to provide honest and candid testimony to the court. And arguments invoking this principle maintain that expert malpractice liability is incompatible with the expert's preemptive duty to the court. And James, I'm curious, do advocates of absolute immunity also rely on any empirical claims to try to push back against expert witness liability as well? Yeah, there are several of those that I identify in the paper. There's five or six, depending on how you count. One of them is sort of a special application of a broader one, and that's the market corrosion hypothesis. I identify both a general version of that and a specific version. The basic claim is that without absolute immunity, the possibility or the prospect of civil liability will drive potential experts from the market, resulting in unmet demand for expert services in litigation. Another hypothesis that I identify is what I call the self-censorship hypothesis, which predicts that without immunity, testifying experts will respond to the possibility of malpractice liability by slanting their opinion in favor of the client's position, taking a more extreme position than they otherwise would, and being less willing 
to change their opinion in response to new evidence. The next one is what I call the retribution hypothesis, which predicts that in the absence of immunity, litigants who fail to obtain a favorable result in the original litigation will file frivolous malpractice claims against their former experts. Some advocates of immunity connect this to the self-censorship or market corrosion hypotheses, but the retribution hypothesis also supports a separate independent argument in favor of immunity based on the waste of judicial resources associated with the adjudication of of frivolous claims, as well as the legal system's interest in finality. And then finally, there's what I call the adversarial sufficiency hypothesis, which predicts that adversarial measures, pretrial deposition, the witness oath, and cross-examination at trial are adequate to ensure truthful testimony in the absence of civil liability. And the argument, therefore, is that civil liability is unnecessary to ensure truthful expert witness testimony. Well, without further ado, James, this now brings us to your view on expert malpractice. I know that this is what I've been waiting for, certainly. So first, what do you make of those normative arguments we discussed earlier in favor of absolute immunity for expert witnesses? Yeah, I reject both of the normative principles as rationales for absolute immunity. Let's start with the client primacy principle. As I alluded to a second ago, there are a couple of ways that you could interpret that principle and the arguments based on it. Taken one way, the broader view, I think the client primacy principle proves too much. Taken another way, what I'll call the weak version of the client primacy principle, I think it proves too little. But I don't think either interpretation justifies absolute immunity. The first interpretation, what I'll call the broader or stronger version of the client primacy principle, it goes something like this. Because clients are ultimately responsible for presenting their own case, this absolves expert witnesses of all responsibility and liability when the client's decisions go badly. Let me say that I think this is actually the correct interpretation of the arguments that are put forth. Some of them really do speak in those terms. But if that's the argument, I think it proves too much because I don't see how that principle articulated in that way wouldn't require abolishing all forms of professional malpractice liability. It's always the case that professional service providers are selected and overseen by their clients. At least in principle, the client is the ultimate decision maker and the professional is exercising delegated authority. So I don't see how we can distinguish testifying experts from other professionals like physicians, accountants, and lawyers on that basis. Now, it's possible that advocates of immunity invoking the client primacy principle only mean to make a weaker point, what I'll call the weaker or narrower version of the client primacy principle, which is that given that the client's oversight of the entire litigation, it will often be difficult to establish that an expert's failure to act with professional competence was a proximate or even a but-for cause of the adverse outcome in, in the underlying litigation. That, I think, is true, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but I think that interpretation really proves too little if it's offered as a rationale for absolute immunity. It simply means that expert malpractice claims will often be difficult to win, even if the expert was negligent. Again, I think that's true, but I don't see how the fact that expert malpractice cases will often be difficult for the plaintiff to win justifies absolute immunity for the defendant. So those are my thoughts on the client primacy principle. Turning to the subordination principle, arguments invoking this principle, as I said a second ago, often tend to say that the expert is, quote, a servant of the court. And that the expert's duty to the court therefore overrides any private duty to the client. I think there are a couple of problems with this argument. First of all, where does the proposition that a testifying expert is the servant of the court come from? Often it comes from nowhere. It's simply asserted with no citation whatsoever. To the extent that advocates of immunity try to identify some authority for that proposition, they usually settle on the helpfulness criterion of Rule 702. The problem with that argument is that Rule 702 is the rule relating to the admissibility of evidence. It does not and probably cannot impose substantive limits on the state tort of professional malpractice. 
there's certainly no reason to think that Congress in enacting Rule 702 intended to impose any such limit. Moreover, even if we accept that the expert has some duty of candor to the court, that duty is entirely consistent with the expert's private duty to the client to act with professional competence. In the United Kingdom, for example, the civil procedure rules state explicitly that it is the duty of experts to help the court on matters within their expertise and that this duty overrides any obligation to the person from whom experts have received instructions or by whom they are paid. But the UK Supreme Court has held in a case called Jones v. Connie that the expert's duty to the court is entirely consistent with professional malpractice liability arising from the expert's failure to act with professional competence in rendering services to the client. So whatever duty the expert owes in the United States to the court, and that is certainly a matter I think that stands in need of further elaboration, there's no reason to think that the expert's duty to the court cannot exist alongside professional malpractice liability that's grounded in the expert's private duty to the client. All right, perfect. So a strong rejection of the normative arguments in favor of absolute immunity for expert witnesses. I'm curious, though, James, what about those empirical hypotheses we discussed earlier that absolute immunity advocates present to support the continued protection of expert witnesses? Do you agree with those empirical hypotheses at all? So this is where we need to draw some of the distinctions based on the types of expert malpractice that I talked about a few minutes ago. Ultimately, I don't think that any of the empirical hypotheses justify absolute immunity, but the reasons for that vary a little bit depending on the different types of expert malpractice claims. So to start with the simplest case, I don't think that the retribution hypothesis or the adversarial sufficiency hypothesis justify immunity with respect to any type of claim. As to the retribution hypothesis, which again is the prediction that without immunity, disappointed clients will file frivolous or retributive malpractice claims against their former experts, I would say two things. First of all, the possibility of frivolous litigation is not usually understood to be a reason for granting immunity. Anytime the law recognizes a civil cause of action, there's some possibility that it may be asserted frivolously. The legal system already provides mechanisms to deal with that, motions for summary judgment, pre-answer motions to dismiss, and in extreme cases, sanctions. I see no reason, and I've never seen an argument presented why the expert malpractice context warrants a different approach than the approach that we typically take to preventing frivolous litigation. And moreover, I think the prediction that declining to immunize expert witnesses from malpractice liability will result in a flood of retributive litigation really hasn't been borne out in the states that permit these claims. Since the 1990s, several states have expressly held that experts are not immune from malpractice claims. And yet the number of reported cases in which these claims are asserted is really quite small. I suspect that's because, as some of the advocates for immunity have pointed out, these cases are often quite difficult to win. Proving causation in particular is going to be challenging in all but the most clear-cut cases, and it, it just doesn't appear that very many plaintiffs are willing to invest the time and money in pursuing malpractice claims against their former experts. I suspect it's no coincidence that in the cases that do tend to be brought, are the ones that in which causation, at least if you accept the plaintiff's allegations are true, is fairly straightforward and fairly obvious. I also don't think that adversarial measures are relevant to the question of expert malpractice. Pretrial deposition, the witness oath, cross-examination, these are all primarily about finding truth and avoiding knowing falsehood. But the, the problem in the expert malpractice context is not typically that the expert is lying. Rather, it's that the expert is incompetent, or at least has not acted with professional competence on behalf of the client. In fact, pretrial depositions are often the point at which the expert's incompetence is revealed to the client for the first time. Now, with respect to the market corrosion and self-censorship hypotheses, I don't think that they warrant absolute immunity either. But here we do need to consider the specific types of expert malpractice claims. 
I don't think market corrosion or the self-censorship hypotheses support absolute immunity at all with respect to malpractice claims of type 1 through type 3. That is, claims asserting nonfeasance, intentional fraud, or a breach of duty that's unrelated to the substance of the expert's opinion. None of those types implicate the substance of the expert's opinion. And so the self-censorship hypothesis, which again predicts that the expert will tend to slant their opinion in the client's favor in the absence of immunity, that concern really doesn't come into play when we're talking about malpractice claims that don't relate in some way to the substance of the expert's opinion. Those claims simply assert that the expert either failed to perform or perform negligently some act that the expert had a duty to perform and did so to the client's detriment. So uh, again, for example, failing altogether to submit a report uh, for which the client has already paid the expert to prepare, which is one of the cases that came up. As to type two claims, claims that the expert has defrauded the client, they involve the substance of the opinion in, in a way, but there's no concern there that the expert has exaggerated their opinion in the client's favor. As to market corrosion, either in its general or its specific form, it frankly seems more beneficial than detrimental to encourage experts who are concerned about liability on type one through type three claims to remove themselves from the market for expert services. Type one and type three claims are really just about the experts doing what they're obliged to do, submitting reports on time, showing up for depositions, reviewing documents carefully before signing them, that sort of thing. Those kinds of claims are easily avoided by a reasonably careful expert. As to type two claims, which assert intentional fraud by the expert against the client, those situations are fortunately quite rare. But again, I, I would think that proactively removing from the market any expert who would be inclined to defraud a client is a good thing, not a bad thing. So I don't think there's any concern about market corrosion arising from liability for these types of claims. Now, with respect to expert malpractice claims of type four through type six, in which the malpractice is associated in some way with the substance of the expert's opinion, it's a little bit more complicated. I do think that market corrosion and self-censorship raise legitimate concerns with respect to these claims. But the point that I would make here is that we can address those concerns through measures less extreme than absolute immunity. And in fact, I think that existing evidentiary rules, as well as the substantive legal rules that apply to professional malpractice, are already sufficient to avoid the bad outcomes that advocates of immunity say can only be avoided by immunizing expert witnesses against civil liability. So take the self-censorship argument that in the absence of immunity, an expert will take extreme positions in support of the client's legal position in order to avoid later being sued. No advocate of immunity of whom I'm aware has ever acknowledged or contemplated the complications of that argument that are created by Rule 702 gatekeeping. That is the rule of the Dalbert Trilogy, now incorporated into Rule 702. Now, I am by no means an ardent defender of Dalbert. I've criticized the case myself and other work, and I agree with many of the criticisms that have recently been made of it. But arguments invoking the self-censorship hypothesis have to acknowledge, and again, as far as I know, none have, that Dalbert Review imposes some limits on the degree to which an expert is likely to take an extreme position in support of the client. It's in the client's interest that the expert be perceived as maintaining some independence from the client, because if the court doesn't think the expert is offering an independent opinion, the court is likely to hold the expert's opinion inadmissible under Rule 702, and that's going to be far more deleterious to the client's position than the experts offering a somewhat weaker opinion in support of the client would have been. And even beyond the client's interest, the practice of Dalbert Review gives the expert a self-interested reason to resist taking implausible positions in support of the client. Resources like Dalbert Tracker, which is available on the LexisNexis, for example, make it possible to track whether an expert has ever been excluded under Rule 702 in prior litigation. And my impression is that there's an impression among experts that that kind of exclusion is, if not a career killer, 
at least has the potential to adversely affect one's ability to retain new clients as a testifying expert. So the existence of gatekeeping review under Rule 702 gives both the client and the expert incentives that run counter to the predictions of the self-censorship hypothesis. I also think there's a further reason why the self-censorship hypothesis is not a compelling rationale for absolute immunity, and this one applies to the market corrosion hypotheses as well. Very briefly put, advocates for absolute immunity have never really grappled with the fact that the existing substantive law of professional malpractice and contracts already do quite a lot at addressing these concerns simply by making expert malpractice cases very difficult to win in all but the most compelling circumstances. So recall that claims of type 4 and type 5 assert negligence in the formation or change of the expert's opinion. And also recall the elements of a professional malpractice claim. The plaintiff has to prove, first, negligence in the performance of a professional service, second, economic loss, and third, causation. Those elements make it very difficult for a plaintiff to prevail on an expert malpractice claim. Even if we grant that economic loss can often be established following an adverse outcome, proving negligence, which requires a showing of a breach of the duty of professional care, and causation will often be quite difficult in the expert malpractice context. As to the duty of professional care, that standard recognizes a fairly broad range of activity for the exercise of professional judgment. Professional is not liable for professional misconduct where they exercised reasonable professional judgment in rendering services to the plaintiff, even if the outcome was not what the client wanted. But even in the relatively rare case in which a plaintiff could prove a breach of the duty of professional care, proving that the expert's negligence caused the plaintiff's economic loss is going to be very difficult due to the complexity of litigation. There's been a little bit of case law on this point already, trying to figure out what the appropriate standard of causation in these cases should be. It's not entirely clear. At least one court in California has applied the trial within a trial standard, which essentially requires the plaintiff to retry the case and prove that the outcome would have been different, but for the experts negligent. That's a very difficult standard to meet, and I think that's a major reason why we don't see more expert malpractice claims brought. I make the point in the article that all of the reported expert malpractice cases have very simple theories of causation. If you credit the plaintiff's allegations, the causal relationship between the expert's actions and the adverse result is fairly obvious. But in most situations, the causal relationship is going to be more complicated, and I suspect that that deters a lot of potential plaintiffs from pursuing those claims. Well, that is an incredible analysis, James. I think that comprehensive look at the empirical hypothesis is just fascinating and incredibly well done on your end. But it tees up for us, I think, the pressing question that's left to address. Given the shortcomings in the normative and the empirical arguments, how would you approach these expert malpractice claims? How should we reform this doctrine? Well, yeah, for all of the reasons stated above, it's probably obvious that I don't think we should immunize expert witnesses from professional malpractice claims. That's actually the first issue to be resolved, and most states still haven't had a case addressing it. I was a little bit surprised at how few cases there are out there. But once we've resolved the immunity issue, I do think there are a few things that we should do to implement expert malpractice liability. The context of litigation does have a few features that distinguish these claims from other expert malpractice cases that we need to take into account. And most notably, I think it's important as we implement expert malpractice liability that we avoid doing so in a way that might displace the attorney as the principal decision maker on matters relating to the development of evidence and trial strategy. The next thing that we need to do is provide a clearer statement of experts' ethical obligations to the court. In this part of the paper, I look especially at the United Kingdom, which in the late 1990s, as part of a broader set of reforms to its civil justice system, implemented a provision that explicitly recognizes that the experts do owe a duty to the court to help the court on matters within their expertise, and that the duty owed to the court overrides any obligation that the expert owes to the client. 
And there have been a number of subordinate regulations and policies implemented to to expand in the UK on that basic rule. Importantly, the Supreme Court of the UK held only after those reforms were in place in a 2011 case that expert witnesses in the UK are not immune from professional malpractice claims and that the duties that the expert owes to the court, which again explicitly supersede the expert's duty to the client, are entirely compatible with professional malpractice liability. I think we need to adopt something like that in the United States. And in fact, my current research project involves taking a closer comparative look at how other countries are approaching this. Finally, we may need to think about the role of the attorney in instructing the expert and defining the scope of the expert's role. It should be clear that where the client's loss was caused by the attorney's failure to properly instruct the expert, rather than the the expert's failure to perform competently as instructed by the attorney, that's an issue of legal malpractice rather than expert malpractice. And as I said a second ago, I think it's very important that expert malpractice law not displace the attorney as the chief strategist. And it's important that we not give the expert any incentive to second guess the attorney's decisions and instructions to the expert. So to the extent that that's come up, the case law is already developing in that way, but I think it's an important point to bear in mind. Awesome. Well, James, this has been an incredible episode. I've been so fascinated to hear you speak about uh, expert witness litigation. I couldn't recommend your paper more highly to our listeners. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Every so often, as we record these various podcasts, I'll come across a paper where I just know we're not going to be able to fill all the amazing content into the time allotted for us. That come the end of the conversation with the guest, I'm going to have to implore the listenership to go out and to actually download the underlying paper and read it because it is so rich with material. And certainly James's paper here, Expert Malpractice, qualifies as one of those instances. Despite all the ground that we covered today in my interview with James, talking about the normative themes underlying expert malpractice, talking about James's typology of different uh, expert malpractice claims, thinking through the implications of imposing liability on expert witnesses. Despite all that, I say this genuinely, we only hit the tip of the iceberg of content when it comes to all that James explores in his paper. For example, in James's paper, he has entire sections exploring the history of expert liability, the history of absolute immunity for actors in the courtroom, and what that history and what that historical case law can teach us when we think about imposing liability on expert witnesses today. So this is truly, truly a podcast where I hope that you won't stop here. To the extent that you're interested in expert witnesses, to the extent that you are particularly interested in malpractice being imposed on expert witnesses, James's paper is the definitive source for you and for your questions. He leaves no stone unturned in this paper as he explores expert malpractice, and I encourage all of our listeners to download a copy of it today. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program and the University of Arkansas School of Law. The producer is Ed Chang, and the production editor is Madeline DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Kira Hammond, and background music is provided by Kirsten Castle Greer, Felix Wong, and Alex Crew. I'm your host, Alex Nunn, and I hope you will join us again next time when we take on another work in the world of evidence and proof. Mm-hmm.